Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning, trembling at the food at thy feet, Lord, to ask that you please be with me as I try to demonstrate something here on the board. Lord, I know that this is what you wanted me to present to your people, and I just ask, Lord, that you hide me behind the grass, that your Holy Spirit and that your word will be spoken through my mouth, and that the people may be able to understand the manna that you have set aside for them today. We thank you. Please forgive us of all of our sins, all of our unrighteousness, all of our iniquity. Bless us, Father, with thy Holy Spirit and thy grace, and lead us, thy guide us, Lord, for we are waiting for your soon coming. We ask this in Jesus' name, by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to everyone. This last week I was challenged by Brother Larry to put my thoughts together of doing something. And I thought, okay, I can do it. Well, had a very turbulent week, and I wasn't really able to do much of what I wanted to do. But nonetheless, the Lord impressed my heart that I should do it. So I'm at least going to do kind of a rough draft of what I really want to do, but it's a lot of detail, and I know that half an hour, there's no way I would be able to take over it. But what I would like to demonstrate today, that in the line of Jesus, that Jesus represents the priest, the disciple represents the Levites, and the Greek represents the 11th hour workers. And this is basically at the very large line, um, so I'm not getting into little details of, um, of what we call them. Fractal. So I'm not going to get into fractal because in the history of Jesus, you find so much information that you can break it down in so many ways. But I'm going to stay at the larger level, and this is what I'm going to try to demonstrate. That basically, everything was done before the cross, and we know that the cross at one level is the Sunday law. The Sunday law um, meaning um, the, the, the final of everything. So what I've started with in here is basically with the week of creation, and I wanted to demonstrate the cycle of the seven-day week. What we have here, day one, we have separation from darkness to light, and the Lord is calling the night, the evening night, <clears throat> and the morning day. And so what I did, I put p.m. and a.m. to demonstrate that. And then uh, also in John 11, 9, the Lord tells us that there's 12 hours of work. <clears throat> the question, where do we work? Do we work during the night or during the day? The day. So basically, it's always the second part of the day, not the first part of the day. So I put in here evening and morning, evening and morning, and so you're going to see how everything kind of fits in together when you come to um, the Passover or the sixth day. Also, I would call it basically Sunday law. In my mind, this is how I would call it. So what I want to demonstrate that in the first day, second day, third day, fourth day, there's always a separation happening. You have a, a separation between darkness and light in the first day. You have a separation between earth and heaven where you have the uh, firmament. Uh, on the third day, you have a separation between the seas and the earth. Day four, you have a separation between the moon and the sun. And then on the fifth day, we begin to fill in this area. We, feel we, we see the seas are being filled with fish, the firmament with fowls. Then on the sixth day, the final day, we have the creation of animals filling the earth, but then we also have Adam. So Adam is created on the sixth, sixth day. He's given dominion diet, and he's given the, the charge to name the animals. Then Adam is taken into a deep sleep. Deep sleep. And then we have, see a rib removed, and Eve is created. And then we see a marriage. But the last thing that the Lord does on the six days creates Eve. And then we have the Sabbath rest. Now, are we supposed to work on the Sabbath? No. So basically, we have a 24 hours of rest, evening and morning. I'm going to take you now to the history of the Passover. We know that Moses was given the charge of how to deal with the Passover. He was told that on the 10th day, of the first month, they were supposed to choose a lamb or, or a goat of one year old had to be male, and they were to take it inside the house and keep it with them. So I marked it here on the 10th day of the first month that they chose a lamb. They had to keep it inside the house, the 10th, the 11th, the 12th, the 14th. And then on the 14th day, they were supposed to slay the lamb or the goat. They were to, supposed to mark their door, three spots, they were supposed to uh, roast it whole 
eat it with bitter herbs and unleavened bread, and they were supposed to be fully dressed and with their staff in their hands. And we know that as soon as they done that, we have the midnight cry. We have the midnight Passover, and then we have the midnight cry. And then we know that they had taken gifts, and they leave Egypt. Again, we see that on the sixth day, and actually it did happen on a Friday. So on the Friday, they already had left out of Egypt. And seventh day, again, we have a rest. Now, the wilderness manna. Uh, again, I'm, I'm going to try to point out to you the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth day, what all happened. On the first day, you have a 12 hours, and a 12 hours makes 24, but if you were to split it in four parts, you have a six, a six, you have four sixes. Let's just put it that way. So when did they gather the manna? Was it in the evening or in the morning, early morning? Which part of the day was that? Early morning. So. They rested in the evening, right? And early in the morning, they woke up and gathered the manna. They got one portion. They had to prepare and eat it the same day. The same thing happened all the way through till we get to the sixth day. Now, what happened on the sixth day? They had to, they had to pick up double portion, and they had to prepare it, correct? Why? The Sabbath rest. So when do you receive the, ma- when do you receive the doubling? On the seventh day or on the sixth day? sixth day. But what do you do with a double portion? When do you use it? Do you use it on the sixth day or the seventh day? The seventh day. Now, I just want you to keep that in mind. Well, you use the second half of the double portion. Well, yeah, you can put one portion for Friday, one portion for Sabbath, but nonetheless, there's double portion, right? So you can set it equal portion for each day. Now, I'm, I, I, was trying, I was trying to think how I'm going to demonstrate to you. I wanted to show you the last two weeks before Jesus' crucifixion, but there's no way I can do that here. So I said, okay, I'm just going to do the six days to pass over. But I want to give you a little bit of a um, history background on that. Can somebody please bring me my water? My throat is really dry. So I'm going to start with um, the winter Thank you so much. The winter before the Passover. And this is something that I've been very curious about. You know that on the 1843 chart, we have the number 164 BC, right? And I've always wondered, why did the Lord allow the 164 BC? Nonetheless, we have no biblical uh, verses for it. All we were just given a history. Well, come to find out what I found out is that Jesus, in John 6, I think... I don't even put Mark in here, but John 6, we're told that Jesus went to the Feast of Dedication. Does anybody know what the Feast of Dedication was? Okay, so I looked it up. You know what the Feast of Dedication is? It takes you right back to Antiochus Epiphanes when he had taken over the sanctuary and had defiled it. And they stopped all the worshiping, and they brought old, um, an image of Zeus, and they basically forced the, pe- forced the people to worship a false god. And when they finally was taken away, they, they rededicated the temple, and that actually happened in 164 B.C. And we're told in the Bible that Jesus was at the Feast of Dedication, and it was winter. So this kind of begins, this is at the very end or at the beginning of his third year, going, going into now three and a half years. So I kind of placed it in my mind that it probably, most likely, was six months before Passover. That's just an estimation from my part. I have no way of proving it. It's just the way I was reasoning. So what we have after the Feast of Dedication, this is basically where Jesus is challenged and basically told, asked, are you really, the, are you really Christ? And he says, yes, I am. And then he's being stoned. And then he basically goes away, he crosses Jordan, and he goes back to where first John the Baptist began baptizing. So again, we're taking right at the very beginning of his process where he was baptized and where he began his ministries. After that, we're told that Lazarus was dying. He had died. Jesus tarried two days, so Lazarus was already buried four days. Jesus comes and resurrects him. And we're told that that was the crowning act of Jesus of resurrecting. It was the evidence, the crowning evidence that Jerusalem and the priest and, and the rulers had that he was the Messiah. After his resurrection, he basically went and, and, and went into hiding. 
And um, I don't have, again, I don't have all my notes put into place, but I know that Jesus goes into hiding, and that's expressed in John eleven fifty four, And he goes into a place called Ephraim. Now, think about Ephraim. What does Ephraim mean? It means doubling, doubling fruit. So Jesus goes into hiding after he resurrected um, Lazarus. At the same time, Sister White tells us in the Desire of Ages that at, right after Jesus resurrected Lazarus, they had found out and they made their first council. And at this council, the chief of the Pharisees have decided that one man should die for the whole nation. So it was already placed a death decree upon Jesus. And we're also told that at that point, Sanhedrin had not been a legal assembly. I wonder, what does that mean? There, was, there were not a legal assembly, but nonetheless, they made a, a, a declaration among themselves that they were going to kill Jesus. And, it's, and they're telling us on page 541 that on this account, counsel delayed to execute the census, but that which they had pronounced. So again, I've always pointed out the judgment comes in three phases. You have an investigation, you have a proclamation, then you have an execution. And right here we're told that Sadhedrin had made a decision that they were not going to execute what they had just proclaimed. From this point on, we are told that there was going to be six days to the Passover. And Jesus had come to Bethany. Now, Jesus, when he comes to Bethany, he always takes rest with Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. And we're also told that he rests there and he stays there over Sabbath. So he's having the Sabbath with, these, um, with his um, beloved ones. Now, we're told that the Simon feast happened somewhere in that time. I'm not really sure whether it happened Saturday night or whether it happened during the Sabbath. I have no way of proving that to you, but I know that somewhere in here, Simon, feeds, Simon gives a feast, feast in the honor of Jesus because Simon was one of the ten lepers that was healed by the Lord. So at Simon's feast, we have Jesus, and then we have at the right side, and I'm, this is my, my assumption that because there was um, Simon and there was um, Lazarus. Lazarus sitting, both of them are sitting next to Christ. And just because Lazarus is representing the... Um, the living testimony, I'm assuming that he would have to be on the right side of Jesus and then Simon on the left. This is where we have the interaction between Jesus and Mary when Mary comes and pours an, and anoints the head and the feet of Jesus. And this is where Simon basically questions his mind if Jesus would only know what this woman is. And then Jesus gives him a parable. In this parable, basically, he brings in two people that own a lot of money. One owns 50, um, well, one owns a part and the other one's the other one more. Uh, so I think it's 50 and 500, if I'm not mistaken. And basically, Jesus tells Simon that because the one that owes more would have more love for Jesus or more love for God or for the person that they own the money. And this is where he basically demonstrates that Mary had loved Jesus more than Simon because she had done a whole lot more for him. I want to bring out something to you, not, not that it's here, but in the line of Jesus at the very beginning, we have the number 500 put in place because Zechariah the priest was, um, when Gabriel came to him, came to him 500 years after he had already appeared to Daniel while he was in captivity. Right here at, um, at uh, Simon's Feast, we have the parable that then, there's also the number of 500 presented. At the triumphal entry, we're also told that now it's 500 years since Zechariah, the prophet announced the, the, born, the, born, the, born, the birth of Jesus. And then at the very end, after Jesus is resurrected, when he has that appointment with all of his disciples, there's 500 who show up for that disciple. So we have four spots where we can place the number 500 as a symbol. Right after Mary anoints Jesus, we see Jesus um, complains, and Jesus is giving him his first open rebuke to Judas. We are also told that the second council took place to kill Lazarus, but also to take Jesus in secret. From here, we're told that uh, Jesus ha has his end triumphal entry, and we're told that as when he gets to the brown of the hill, 
there's a declining sun, so we know that we're basically close to sundown, right? The reason I put this here, because I want to point out to you that Jesus was, was the lamb, was the chosen lamb by the people, and he was done right on the 10th day of the first month. I want to point out that he lines out exactly with that. So we know that Jesus had requested a colt, right? So he could ride the colt. You mean when they made this deal to betray him and to kill him, they chose him? No. When he had entered Jerusalem and everybody was um, crying out, Hosanna, Sister White points out that basically they have chosen their king. So I can say Jesus represents the king, Jesus represents the lamb, but Jesus also represents our high priest, right? So there's different application that we can give to Jesus. And at this point, though they, they, though they had accepted him and hoping that he was going to be a king, really what they were choosing, they were choosing their lamb to be slain four days later. Four, four days later. Not just that, but we know that the crowning evidence was taking him inside Jerusalem, and as he got up on the hill, he looked upon Jerusalem.